evening. I'm Beth Voorhees. Welcome to this special edition of the Legislature Today. We're broadcasting live from the state capitol, where in just a few minutes, the House of Delegates will convene a public hearing. The hearing is called by the House Health, Finance, and Judiciary Committees. These three committees will consider Senate Bill 373 to regulate above-ground storage tanks. That bill came as a result of the Elk River chemical spill on January 9th. That spill contaminated the drinking water for 300,000 residents in nine West Virginia counties. Many of these customers still consider the water unsafe to consume. This live public hearing will preempt our production of the legislature today, this evening. Delegate Purdue, who is the chair of the House Health and Human Resources Committee, is opening this public hearing. So let's take you live to the House Chamber at the State Capitol. What happened, how it happened, and most importantly, how we can keep it from ever happening again. So as you make your commentary, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and again, it is to give us direction. We're going to the public now. Uh, we've heard from a number of experts. Uh, we'll hear from more. But we're asking to hear from the public now, those who were most affected, as to what you think we should be doing, what we didn't do, what we should do, and what we must complete the task of doing while we're in session this year. Recognizing, of course, that this is an issue that has uh, ramifications, has a reach far broader than probably we can deal with in even the rest of the session if that's all we did. So I'm assuming, and, and I would guarantee you, uh, there will be opportunities at the latest, I'm quite sure, to revisit this. It does have national implications. With that, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do is I will announce two speakers. I will announce the one who is at the podium and the next one coming up. As I do that, if you would just come over here. I think right now we have seats for everybody, pretty much. I think all the folks that are seated here will be speaking. Um, and we have, we have them, uh, I believe we have them, Defined by number, is that right, Chairman? There is count. Okay. So what I will do is uh, I will announce uh, the individual who is going to be speaking and the person immediately following him, and, or him or her. And if you would, as I announce your name, please come up here and just kind of retire over here by the uh, by the podium. Right. As I say, each person will have two minutes to speak. Uh, because of the number of people who are speaking uh, and because of the relatively uh, complicated nature of trying to do that, we won't be ceding time to other individuals. Uh, you will be speaking on your behalf, and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, is that it? That's it. Yes, sir. Very good. All right, so the first speaker we're going to have up is, I believe this is Tim Sayer from the Kanawha from Kanawha IT Services Incorporated, and then after him, following him immediately, is Mr. Gary Zuckett of the West Virginia Citizens Action Group. Mr. Sayre? Oh, and by the way, you will have this uh, time when the red light comes on, it's your signal to stop. Oh, and I forgot one other thing. You can submit a written commentary. We have the ability to do that uh, uh, on the website. Is that right? Yes. Please. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was born and raised in West Virginia. My family, as far back as I know, is from West Virginia. We took West Virginia history in seventh grade, so I know what happened in Hawks Nest, Mate Juan, and Blair Mountain. We do not trust you. We have not trusted you for years, and you have not let us down. Historically, this state has been one of the worst in the nation for protecting its citizens and regulating industry. Looking back, the only way things have changed has been through bloodshed and violence. I do not want this. I hate violence. I've seen enough bloodshed. It has been said that through the political system, change can happen. I do not believe this, but we have no other choice. Prove me wrong, but do not forget this. We are mad, and we are watching you. I understand that not all politicians are corrupt. We have some great ones right here. What I do not understand is how in this time of record profits for almost all big industries that we do not charge them a small fraction of a percentage of these profits to pay for the enforcement of these safeguards. And I do not understand how anyone can overrule the wishes of their constituents so much of the time. But my biggest concern right now, and the question I want to put to you is this, why are you in such a hurry to destroy the scene of the crime why will you not permit no order, 
core samples to find the true extent of the damage. And what are you trying to hide? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Sayer. We now have Gary Zuckett, followed by Paul Corbett Brown, the Keeper of the, Mount from the, Keeper of the Mountains. Mr. Zuckett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, public. Uh, my name is Gary Zuckett. I'm executive director of West Virginia Citizen Action Group. And uh, we stand here in support of Senate Bill 373. We think it should be made stronger. And I believe that many of the speakers coming after me will uh, detail how that needs to be done. Uh, you'll hear from other groups uh, during this hearing. And you'll hear for the, for, from regular citizens at this hearing, people that probably have not been in this chamber ever before, let alone speaking at a public hearing. Uh, and, uh, but what we have here today is a war on water. And the war on water is not coming from D.C. It's right under this roof. Year after year, lobbyists for the polluters relentlessly push to undo and weaken laws written to keep our waters clean. A good example. Uh, the first committee to take up Senate Bill 373 and pass it out at that very same committee meeting approved a rule to allow more toxic aluminum in our waterways. We have fracking in the mountains uh, in the northern counties here in West Virginia. Uh, we have mountaintop removal and sludge from coal processed with the same chemical that spilled in Charleston's water supply in the southern counties. And right here in uh, Chemical Valley, we're holding our breath, waiting for the next spill. Uh, yes, Charleston, yes, West Virginia, we have a war on water here in the Mountain State, and that's why West Virginia Citizen Action is proud to be a friend of water. Thank you, Mr. Zucker. We have Paul Corbett Brown, followed by Mr. Norm Steenstra. Good evening. My name is Paul Corbett Brown. I am uh, president and chair of Keeper of the Mountains Foundation from here in Charleston. Um, a couple of things that I'd like to ask first is, does anybody in here have any idea what wildfires on the West Coast have to do with the water conditions in West Virginia? It's quite simple. While much of the rest of this nation scrambles to find clean water to drink, we in West Virginia were blessed and I say we're blessed with clean water. But generations of industry that have run rampant on this state have tainted that water. Now, those natural resources that lie underneath the ground are the resting place for hundreds of millions of years old forests. But these mountains are something more than that. They're the birthplace of rivers. And there is nothing, nothing more precious to us in this world than water, clean water. We have here an amendment that we're proposing to this bill, and it's basically the citizen enforcement of environmental laws. There's been a lot of press given to um, different agencies of the government that have done things during this crisis. One of the things that's been overlooked is while all this has been going on in the larger metropolitan areas, groups like OVEC, Coal River Mountain Watch and Keeper of the Mountains and many others, I'm sorry I can't list all of you, have been busy collecting water and donating it, delivering it hand by hand, one bottle at a time, into the far-reaching areas of our communities, to people who don't have access to it, to people who can't drive to get it, to people who are too sick to get out. The point is simply this. If we as citizens have the capacity to stand up in this time of crisis and deliver this water, then we as citizens also should have the capacity to protect our water. And that's what this is. Citizen enforcement of environmental laws is basically to allow us the right to sue. Mr. Brown. Thank you. I want Thank this you, to be entered as a permanent record. Thank you, sir. And I am Mr. Norm Steesra, followed by Patty Hamilton of the West Virginia Association of Counties. Thank you, Chairman Manchin and Chairman Purdue. My name is Norm Steesra. I'm speaking as a, a private citizen and land uh, homeowner in Charleston tonight. 
For 25 years, I've watched this House pass some of the most visionary and timely laws designed to protect the air, land, and water in West Virginia. During that same time, I've watched the DEP and four governors do everything to undermine, weaken, and ignore that legislative intent of those laws that you passed. But the buck stops at the top. I'm sure the governor is a fine man, and I'm sure Secretary Randy Huffman is a fine man, but it, it, they are the ones that are responsible for the culture of this non-inspection and non-enforcement in West Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, please. If there is one element that this bill must contain, it is that the local health departments have equal authority to inspect the above ground tanks. They're far less political than the present structure that we have. In summary, we cannot put all the enforcement regulation, inspection, and regulate, uh, enforcement and inspection eggs into the DEP's basket alone. I urge you to uh, include the local Department of Health in any kind of inspection and enforcement in this action today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steenstra. This is West Virginia Public Radio. You're listening to a special edition of the legislature today, and we apologize for the audio difficulties that we are experiencing. Director of the West Virginia Association of Counties, representing all of West Virginia's 55 counties and all of our elected county officials. Many of us learn from, from our moms that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And this certainly applies to this situation. The pound of cure, in the case of Kanawha County uh, alone, was about $300,000 in direct costs for overtime equipment and supplies. And this did not count any purchase of water. Indirect costs are almost incalculable at this time. These costs were borne across several county agencies, and again, that is one county out of the nine affected counties. County government is very close to the people that they serve, and they inform the public, but they can't provide information if they are not directly briefed during a crisis, and, the, and communication could have been much improved during this crisis, especially during the first couple of days, so that county government could better inform its citizens. Law enforcement was profoundly affected in the counties, <clears throat> of, and of course they absorbed overtime costs, but it is the future complexion of our security and safety that law enforcement will be more uh, <clears throat> attuned to. Uh, this has really changed the complexion of safety and security, and uh, they, they're entering a new era. They're entering an era where they will be learning and training how to deal with situations that up to this point have really been just a tabletop discussion for law enforcement. They will now be more vigilant and observant. The training will be uh, according to what they need to do to prevent these types of situations from happening. We have, become, we have been a training ground now for anyone who wants to be disruptive. And so law enforcement must react and learn how to deal with these situations. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. We now have Phil Rainey of Oak Hill, followed by Maya Nye of the people concerned about chemical safety. Mr. Rainey. I'm just a citizen who lives in Oak Hill. I live within two miles of a injection well. It's called. It's run by an operator by the name of Danny Webb. It's been operating without a permit uh, for at least the last six months. We had a hearing in the June, or the first of June, uh, well attended. The West Virginia DEP has not acted as yet, one way or another, except to allow the operator to continue his operation. This injection well drains into uh, the Wolf, Wolf Creek, which 
empties into the the New River, where Boy Scouts go rafting when they're here. Uh, I think maybe more should be made of that. Anyhow, I have a summary of what's on the website for this Trell's operation. It's serviced by a, a facility that is open, uh, no restrictions on it, day and night. Trucks can c- come in without any hazmat markings on them at all, uh, day and night. There's a picture that my daughter and I took of a trunk of a truck unloading uh, whatever was in it because the fracking industry doesn't have to tell us what's in it. That's proprietary. And I want to point out to you that what I'm talking about here is ongoing. It's not something that we're getting ready for to happen to us. Uh, Mr. Rainey, can you close? Okay, yes, I can. And I uh, would like to have you take this material and incorporate it in some way, however you're going to do that. Thank you, sir. We now have Maya Nye, followed by Richard Katz, who is listed as a citizen. Chairman, good afternoon, Thank you for allowing me to speak today, committee members and uh, members of the public. Um, my name is Maya Nye. Um, I'm a citizen. I was born and raised in uh, St. Albans, about a mile away from the Bayer Crop Science uh, facility. My dad worked for the chemical um, industry, worked for the crop for his entire career. I worked at Union Carbide when I was in college trying to pay the bills. My mom worked there. My stepfather worked there. Um, I, I just kind of wanted to give that background so I understand uh, how important chemical supplements is for in a lot of ways. I also know that um, they have been a consistent um, consistent issue with impact on the health of uh, many of the people that I know and love. Uh, I want to thank Senator Andre for taking such swift action on bringing the 373 uh, to light to try to address the issues that happen around the chemical spill. Um, and I really encourage you, I'm very thankful that you had this public hearing, and I think that uh, continuing to have forums like this is some of the most important, one of the most important things that you'll ever do. There are a lot of people, how many people in this room are committed to making sure that something like this never happens again? Can you raise your hand, please? specifics that I feel like would be helpful to implement into the bill, but I'm going to save those for my written comments. Um, some, of the, some of the things I just wanted to make sure and let you know is that I, I believe that um, citizen enforcement of um, uh, citizen enforcement, I feel like uh, citizen enforcement suits awarding attorney's fees when, uh, when the government is not doing a sufficient job at um, inspecting facilities and, and keeping us safe, and the industry is also not doing the same. This is something that is extremely important. Um, sort of reiterating what other folks have said, um, support the authorization of uh, local health departments to inspect these facilities. Um, funding for the LEPCs, the local emergency planning committees um, that are tasked to respond to these emergencies. Funding um, additional enforcement. Uh, can close. Yes, um, we still don't know. We still don't have a lot of answers. And I feel like this bill, one of the things that it's missing is really sort of the, the human element of, uh, you know, we, we could really use some medical surveillance at this point and understanding more about what the long term effects are to exposures like this. So thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Nye. You're listening to special coverage on the legislature today, and again, we apologize. We're experiencing audio difficulties within the program at the Capitol. Again, uh, it is do not adjust your radios. We are having technical difficulties, and we apologize for the inconvenience. Mr. Chairman, members of the House, my name is Richard Katz, and I come here today with my seven-year-old daughter, Ava Rose Katz, and my wife, Jody. I am a fourth-generation West Virginian. I am a lawyer, I am a small businessman, and I am a deeply concerned citizen. But first and foremost, I am a husband, 
and a father. And I am responsible for the health, safety, and welfare of my family. And in these past three weeks, it has been a helpless feeling to feel like I could not provide that. I chose and we chose to live in West Virginia to raise our family. I love this state and I love the people of this state. But unfortunately, I feel like West Virginia no longer belongs to we, the people. The groundwork has been laid for decades and it's been made clear over the past three weeks that it truly belongs to industry and special interests. Regulations, yourselves, it cuts into his time. Regulations, which we have, are weak, non-existent, and where we have them, inadequate and poorly enforced. Government has failed in its responsibility to put our families first. This needs to end now. I request the following actions with respect to Senate Bill 373, and I'm sure there are other speakers who will speak more specifically about it. A handful. Close the loopholes. There's too many exceptions and exemptions in the bill as written. Require drinking water protection plans. Require permits and inspections for all potential significant polluters in zones of critical concerns above drinking water intakes. Mandate industry-based funding sources for the bill so that the DEP's inspectors, administrative support, and other required resources are, are being able to be paid for. And please exclude, include an explicit citizen suit provision to enable citizens to enforce the law when the DEP and violators don't. Okay. And please, finally, we gather tonight in the People's House and we stand at a crossroads. The situation could not be more dire and the consequences of action or inaction could not be more severe. It's time to return this great state to its people. We are watching, our children are watching, the nation and this state are watching what you do. Please act. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Kath. We now have Lori Magano, yeah. citizen from Charleston. Hello. My name is Dr. Lori Magana, and I have proudly lived in West Virginia most of my life, southern West Virginia. Living here has provided me with a great life that includes wonderful friends, a job that I'm very passionate about, working as a physical therapist with special needs children, and of course, I love the awe-inspiring beauty of the West Virginia Hills. On January 9th, my world was turned upside down when the public was notified of the Freedom Spill. If our state had rigorous laws that were properly enforced, we would not be living through this catastrophe where the drinking water of thousands of citizens was poisoned. The people of my town, Charleston, have lost income and revenue from the loss of business and tourism dollars. At this point, it is difficult to assess the long-reaching negative effect to our economy from the many that have chosen to leave and who will leave our state. A safe water supply is a necessity, not a luxury. Bill 373 must have provisions that close the loopholes that have allowed this tragedy that has affected as many people as it has. Any and all tanks that have the potential to contaminate our water sources must be meticulously regulated. I support the recommendations of the Chemical Safety Board, but to also include facilities that store Tier 2 chemicals. However, the taxpayers should not have to carry the burden and cost of regular inspections by qualified inspectors. The companies who profit from the use of our land, why aren't they required to bear the price tag to ensure that they follow safe practices? Certainly, we must be protected from future disasters, but it is equally important to effectively clean up this current spill in an environmentally sound manner. We must be able to completely flush the chemical from the treatment plant as well as all lines that go to our homes, schools, and businesses as soon as possible so that we can wake up from this never-ending nightmare. I have many friends who say to me, Lori, speak for us, and I want you to know that even though I stand here alone, I, I represent many. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lori. We now have Jill, Jill Watkins, a concerned citizen, followed by Laura Thaw. My name is Jill Watkins, and I live in South Charleston. I've gotten headaches from the water, and while the smell is not entirely gone, it is getting better. I won't be drinking or cooking with it for quite a while. 
The past few weeks have been stressful, to say the least. I have just a couple comments after reading Senate Bill 373. I want to make sure that any references to excluded facilities due to existing EPA re regulations include language that these facilities are actually following EPA regulations and do not get wrapped up in any future lawsuits filed by our state against EPA's regulation of the Clean Water Act. Section 2230-5 of this bill deals with registration of existing tanks. It states, among other things, that the proximity to any water intake be documented. The word intake should be removed so that proximity to any body of water is required to be documented. According to EPA, over 90% of West Virginians get at least some of their drinking water from streams that are seasonal, rain-dependent, or headwaters. This leads me to conclude that all bodies of water in every part of this state are important to keep clean now and for future generations. My, prim my primary concerns now are how homes will be properly flushed of MCHM, how we view industrial chemicals from here on out, noting that just because a chemical is not labeled as hazardous or toxic, that it can still have adverse impacts on the public and environmental health, and how our state can recover from this event to be not just an energy leader, but also an environmental leader worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. We now have uh, Laura Thaw, followed by Nancy Ward. And folks, uh, let me ask you if you've made a kind of not get real close to the mic because apparently it doesn't transmit very well with regard to what we're doing uh, in the Internet. I reside in Charleston with my husband and two children. Following the Freedom Industries chemical leak, it is clear that the public has been failed on so many levels, from lack of regulation and enforcement to weak emergency responses to not keeping the citizens informed and updated. After attending three town hall meetings, my confidence has not at all been restored. I'd like to share something from my personal history. I grew up in a different chemical valley from Wilmington, Delaware. My father was a PhD chemist with DuPont for over 30 years. My siblings and I were raised believing that our environment was safe, the oceans and rivers we swam in, the parks we played in, and the water we drank. We had faith in our politicians and leaders, but six years ago this changed. My mother was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a serious blood cancer, cause unknown. Her oncologist speculated that exposure to some type of toxin was likely the culprit. With the best treatments available, she lived for 18 months and died before she was 70. My father is presently dying of pulmonary fibrosis, a progressive lung condition with no known cure and limited treatment, cause unknown. Specialists have suggested that multiple exposures to toxins many years previous have li likely contributed to his disease. My brother has had several bouts of bladder cancer. Again, his urologist points the finger at toxic exposure from many years ago. These are not genetic issues. These are not lifestyle issues. These are environmental issues, and they are real. I have lived in Charleston for 21 years. My family takes advantage of numerous outdoor adventure activities. We support the local cultural scene, support local businesses and restaurants, and volunteer. All of this contributing to the prosperity of this community. I would like to remain a part of this community, but the risks of staying are beginning to outweigh the benefits. The citizens of West Virginia deserve better than this. We deserve thorough protection from all contamination threats to our water supplies. We need a monitoring and surveillance program to evaluate the ongoing and long-term health effects from this unstudied chemical as well as other disasters should they occur. Senate Bill 373 must be written with care, keeping the citizens of West Virginia at the heart of it, not big industries with loopholes to protect them. The time for change is today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We now have Nancy Ward, followed by Destiny Gallagher, I believe. Ms. Ward. My name is Nancy Ward, and I've been a Charleston business owner for 27 years. We've taken a heavy hit financially because of this latest disaster. Why should we, as small businesses, pay for the negligence of a few select industries? This is what happens when the needs and greed of the few outweigh the needs and health of the many. There will be long-term consequences, not only to the health and well-being of the people affected, but to the economy and the in image of this state.
Citizens and businesses we can ill afford to lose are contemplating leaving. New businesses looking to relocate are going to avoid this state unless we make changes in the way we protect our citizens and the environment. You have the opportunity to make this city and state a poster child for how we take a bad situation and use it as a catalyst for change. We demand strong legislation that provides real protection for all the streams and rivers in our state. The 25-mile critical safety zone needs to be expanded. All tanks and other potential sources of contamination must be inspected regularly and funded by the industry. I don't know of any restaurant, food service business, or car owner who is exempt from regular inspections. Should any business or industry with far greater potential to harm thousands be exempt? The bill should include significant fines, jail time, and it must give citizens the power to sue if the law is not enforced. This bill needs to include the recommendations of the Chemical Safety Board and downstream strategies. We are watching you, and depending on your actions, we will decide if this is a place we want to stay and raise our families, do business and retire, or is it time to leave? All the advertising and spin in the world won't bring tourists or conventions to a place where water is not safe to drink, much less swim or boat in. Water really is our most precious resource. Let's start giving it the protection it deserves. You say this will never happen again, but unless you are willing to pass legislation that is effective and properly enforced, I guarantee it will happen again and again and again. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We now have Destiny Gallagher. Thank you so much for letting me speak. And you're with Epic Girl Leadership, is that correct? Yes. Right, please go ahead. Right. Hello, I'm Destiny Gallagher, and I'm 15 years old, and I'm from Boone County, and I have some very important questions. First off, why are we still paying for contaminated water? And also, why is it not okay for elderly people to drink, pregnant women, or young children, but yet it is safe for us when clearly we know it is not? For example, two girls that I know of that go to Sherman Elementary had come home with chemical burns and irritations in the eye from the school's water. Their mother was using bottled water at home and then had called America, American Company Water. And she called it four times, had gotten no response. The lack of accountability is very unacceptable. It seems that nobody is helping now that the FEMA has pulled out. It has become the community's responsibility with local groups groups and churches to pick up the relief of the water's effort. We need this legislation to go further for us to know that it will not happen again, and my fear is that all the politicians are getting paid too much money by the corporations that are polluting our drinking water to save their bottom lines. We deserve better than this, and these chemical spills and lack of reg regularization is affecting people's lives. Water is a necessity to our everyday lives, and we cannot allow it to be poisoned anymore. Thank you, ma'am. We now have Mr. Jim Kotkon of the West Virginia Sierra Club, followed by Colleen Anderson. Good evening. My name is James Coatson. I am the energy chair for the West Virginia chapter of Sierra Club. We have had a long history of advocating on behalf of clean water. And that long history compels us to point out some flaws and weaknesses and things that need to get fixed. But my first question is, who are we listening to? If you want a bill that protects clean water, you should probably listen to the people who advocate for clean water, not the polluters. The spill on January 9th was not a fluke or an accident. It was an inevitable and easily predictable result of our current regulatory structure. The problems are systemic within DEP and within our whole framework. Einstein identified this problem. He said, we cannot solve problems using the same kind of thinking that created them. And I appreciate the pledge from Senate President Jeff Kessler on Thursday when he promised this would never happen again. 
But I do not believe, and I don't think anyone believes, that slapping one more narrowly crafted permit system on one more narrow segment of industry is going to correct those fundamental errors. A real solution will require a new approach. That's why we support an approach recommended by the Chemical Safety Board. We believe that we need proactive approaches to groundwater and surface water protection. And we think that the narrow framework in Senate Bill 373 needs to be expanded. Numerous loopholes and restrictions need to be removed. We need to have shared responsibility among various agencies, and we need to include community right to know provisions. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. We now have Colleen Anderson, followed by Amy Weintraub. Colleen is with the Concerned Citizens of Charleston. I am a concerned citizen. I'm a songwriter, and so it, and it focuses me to write a song, so that's what you're going to get from me. If you love my West Virginia, you will keep her waters clean. If you love my West Virginia, you will keep her mountains green. If you love my West Virginia, love her wonderful and wild. You'll respect her like your mother and defend her like your child. If you love my West Virginia, you would suffer for her sake. If you love my West Virginia, you will give more than you take. If you love my West Virginia, you would grieve to see her kneel. To the ones who only use her For the riches they can steal And if you love my West Virginia You will hold her in your soul If you love my West Virginia you won't watch her mountains fall If you love my West Virginia You will fight to see her stand With her summits bathed in glory Like our Prince Emmanuel's land Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have Amy Weintraub. Is that correct? You want to say who's following me? Oh, uh, well, I should. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Amy. Followed by Philip Smith of the West Virginia Trouts Unlimited. Please, Amy. I'm here representing West Virginia Free, which is a women's health policy organization and advocacy group. And we, our research shows that the Kanawha River has more reproductive and developmental toxins dumped into it than almost any other waterway in the United States. The fact is, most women in West Virginia aren't really aware of that. Most people aren't. But the one thing that's come out of this Liberty Industries spill into the Elk River is that we're becoming aware. We're becoming aware of the problems with our waterways. And as women, we know that we have to protect ourselves during our childbearing years in a certain, in, a, in, in special ways. We must protect our children. And when women wake to this type of thing, mountains move. When women wake, mountains move. When women rise, the world rises with us. SB 373, it's a good start. The fact is it doesn't go far enough. We haven't been aware of all of the things that needed to have been happening, we the people. But some state, state policymakers and local policymakers have been aware. In fact, they've been aware since 2008. And the Bayer Crop Science Explosion and the Chemical Safety Board made specific, many specific recommendations to our leaders, telling them what it needed to happen to protect us. They're all available to all of us. I made a little shortcut 
tinyearl.com CSB recommendations. You can all put it in your smartphones right now, put it on your laptops, and you can get all the recommendations that are there. They're awesome. Things like effective systems of independent oversight, collaboration of multiple stakeholders, and most importantly, right now, where I sit as a mom, this is my daughter Caroline, by the way, she's 12 years old, the most important thing right now is to, is to make things safe and then increase our confidence, the confidence of the community and the workforce and local authorities and the ability of facility owners to prevent and respond to accidental releases of highly hazardous chemicals. Prevention and release. That's what we're looking for. Please improve SB 373 to include the Chemical Safety Board recommendations. We apologize for the inconvenience, but we are experiencing audio difficulties from the Capitol with the special coverage of the legislature today, so please do not adjust your radio, and again, we apologize for the inconvenience. Hi, I'm Philip Smith, uh, Chair of West Virginia Council of Trout Unlimited, speaking on behalf of our 1,600 members. Uh, according to the Congressional Sportsman Foundation research, there are more than 364,000 hunters and anglers spending more than uh, $1.5 billion each year in West Virginia. Annual spending by hunters and anglers equals 40% of our state's mining gross state product. Our top concern as sportsmen is the priority of reasonable po policy in protecting cold, clean, fishable water in West Virginia. This state has an established history of substandard rules and arbitrary enforcement of the Clean Water Act. Sportsmen now call upon the legislature to be diligent in ensuring clean headwaters on both public and private land. There must be questions about how the West Virginia DEP prioritizes their inspections. The DEP may be underfunded and understaffed, but DEP should be asked why they are pushing an aluminum bill that is specifically designed to cater to industry and weaken protection for aquatic life, specifically the aquatic life that makes up a large component of that $1.5 billion in spending that I referenced earlier. Why is this a good time to pursue weakened water protections? Recent events indicate that more protections are needed, not less. Senate Bill 373 needs to address regulation for all tanks and all potential point sources for contamination of our streams and rivers. At Freedom Industries, even a cursory inspection would have generated a long list of violations based on the requirements of the West Virginia Groundwater Protection Act and their stormwater permit. It is evident that continuing to do what we've been doing is unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. <clears throat> we now have Ms. Susan Johnson, followed by David Adam Coffey. Good evening, everyone. Uh, when I leave here, I'm going over to the public meeting because I have a plan to, to clean the water with anaerobic bacteria. One of the main reasons I came to this meeting was I felt that it should be a part of the response plan uh, due to an emergency like this where uh, chemicals are known, uh, things that can, can help to, to make that response quicker. If, if a chemical like this, being mostly organic, can be fixed or it could have been slowed down by using anaerobic bacteria right then, uh, some of this might have been able to have been dealt with. I think the response plan, along with being responsible citizens uh, and responsible business owners, uh, your response plan should have something in it that, that allows you to react immediately, other than just making a simple phone call. Uh, we, we, need to, uh, we need continuity back with our water, and I don't foresee that anytime soon. It's going to take a really good cleaning of the entire system from, the, from the, where the uh, event happened all the way down to our hot water heaters. And if anaerobic bacteria can take care of this problem, I believe that it can probably fix a lot of problems in the future if we have any more, and I'm sure we will. But uh, the response plan, I think, is extremely crucial. We force the coal industry to do it, uh, and we, do to, we, we ought to have uh, the tank companies and all these chemical companies doing the very same thing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> David Adam Coffey, Friends of Water, followed by Julian Martin. Hello, my name is David Adam Coffey. I live in South Hills, and I'm with Friends of Water. I'll be brief, and my message is very simple. This bill represents only a first step towards giving West Virginians the regulations we deserve and the protections that we need against the very same polluting industries that contribute financially to many of the delegates here. 
I want to formally request that all actions taken on this bill be via roll call votes and that they are on the record. I am a friend of water, and we the people demand transparency in this process. We will hold you accountable, and if you do not vote for us, we will not vote for you. <laughs> Julian Martin, followed by Charles Price. I, I want to know who uses that chemical that was spilled into my water. Where is it used? Why is it there? Coal. Ah, oh, the coal industry uses that, right? They benefit from that, don't they? So I propose that you include in this bill a stipulation that the coal industry must pay for all of the costs brought about by this bill. The, the cost of my, my granddaughter missing work, the cost of the restaurant she works in, not being open, the health costs, all those costs. Let's let the coal industry pay for this because they are the ones that have benefited from it. And as a matter of fact, I suggest that the name of the bill be something like the Coal Cleaning Chemical Bill. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Mr. Charles Price, followed by Angie Rosser of the West Virginia Rivers Coalition. Mr. Price is with the Sierra Club. Hi, my name is Bill Price, and I am with the Sierra Club, uh, and I also am a resident of the East End of Charleston, West Virginia, currently, and for most of my life was living in a little town called Dorothy, West Virginia, in the southern part of the state in the middle of the coal fields. So I'm not a stranger to not being able to go to your tap and turn your water on and understand that you're not sure what's coming out of it or that it's safe or that it will be there tomorrow. And that's unfortunate. But it's a fact of life for many residents in the southern coal fields still yet today. And it's a fact of life for many residents in the uh, counties where they're doing the fracking for natural gas today. And still yet today, it's a fact for many of us in Charleston, West Virginia. I've been talking a lot about the cause of this spill and the difference between cause and condition. The cause of this spill was there was a tank that some idiot decided was okay to be above the uh, water intake. But the condition that, create, that was created that allowed that to happen was the lack enforcement of regulations the Clean Water Act and other laws in this state. What allowed that condition to happen was because the coal industry can come in here and say what we need is a decreased uh, standard on aluminum and it happens. What they can say is we need a decreased standard in selenium and it happens. What we need is to be able to dump our waste from fracking into landfills, and that hasn't happened yet, and hopefully it won't, because you understand how this systematic problem has been allowed to exist for years and decades. I think this is a wake-up call. I hope it is a wake-up call for you and for you all, because if it's not, there is a, uh, a vote coming up by these people that will make it so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. This is Angie Rosser of the West Virginia Rivers Coalition, followed by David Lillard of the Observer Citizen. Good evening. My name is Angie Rosser. I'm the executive director of the West Virginia Rivers Coalition, a nonprofit statewide organization who's been advocating for clean water for over 25 years now. We issued a report uh, with downstream strategies that details the failures, the gaps, the needed reforms related to source water protection, and I will submit um, a summary of that with my written comments on those technical details. Um, one thing that 
has really stood out for me was a quote um, that was published in the Charleston Gazette by the secretary of the DEP, Randy Huffman, who said, quote, this incident could have been prevented or minimized just with the regulations we have in place, but it just didn't click in anybody's mind that this was a concern. It didn't click in anyone's mind that these tanks that have been there since pre-World War II with hazardous chemicals right above our drinking water intake was a concern. We need to make it click. We've known since 2007 to 2012, Freedom Industries filled out the, the forms, the tier two forms that they were re required to do, saying that tens of thousands of gallons of MCHM were there and were an immediate physical and health hazard. So we have to figure out some of these systemic issues of why haven't this clicked, what are the existing regulations that need beefed up, and who, who would we hold accountable? And just speaking, but, and, and one other thing we're worried about this bill is it's, it's limited in scope that's been spoken. It, it deals with a very subset of tanks. This alone we know won't solve the problem. For example, in Charleston we have 51 significant potential contaminant sources to our drinking water. Freedom Industry site is one, but we want to know what is happening with those other 50. And as just as a West Virginian who lives along the Elk River who loves to swim in the Elk and uh, you know, I'm not from West Virginia. I chose to come here right after college because I fell in love with this state. And I'm hearing from friends who have just had it. They like, I'm out of here. I'm telling my kids to leave, not come back. And that's that's disheartening. And I think this is a very rude awakening. It's not just about one leaky tank. This is about redeeming our state and and redeeming ourselves from going down this path of degradation of our water resources Ms. and Russell. of our people. Thanks. <laughs> Mr. David Lillard, uh, I'm the Observer Citizen, followed by Sheila McIntyre, Mac McIntyre, a Concerned Citizen. Hi, I'm David Lillard from Jefferson County, uh, where I'm a newspaper publisher. Uh, Delegate Skinner, Lawrence, Householder, Espinosa, and others from the Eastern Panhandle that I might not be able to see. Greetings from back home. You are our elected leaders. I'm just a messenger from the hundred or so readers who have contacted our paper or that I've heard in forums. First, the people of the Eastern Panhandle want the people of these nine counties to know that we are with you. We are with you. You're not alone in this. And we want the members of this body to know that we also drink water, that what you do is really about the entire state of West Virginia, this terrible incident bestowed upon these good people, what you do will have ramifications throughout the rest of the state. We send our thanks to Senator Unger for his leadership in introducing Senate Bill 373. It's an important step. We also want to thank him in advance for his patience as the distinguished members of this body, this chamber, take the time they need to give careful consideration, thoughtful consideration to this measure. Please let there be no rush to legislate, only the will to follow through on a bill that includes comprehensive reforms, not just on above-ground storage tanks, one that mandates and funds local source water protection plans with industry footing the bill to craft and implement these plans, and one that inspires pride in our mountains and valleys and the people that deserve it. Finally, we wish to thank Senator Unger in advance for the spirit of collaboration and leadership he will demonstrate when this bill is sent to conference to work out the differences after the bill is improved by this body. Mr. Lord. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Sheila McKenna, a concerned citizen, followed by Eleanor Spore. My name is Sheila McEntee, and I am here as a resident of Charleston. I am here because I am still living through what the National Science Foundation has called one of the largest human-made environmental disasters in this century. 
Like so many others, I lost my clean water after the January 9 Freedom Industries spill into the Elk River. For nine days after the water companies go ahead to flush, I would not use my water for anything due to the stench. This was difficult, but I feared for my health. Eventually, I could not go without the water. I have washed my body and belongings in, in water laced with a substance that was made for washing coal. I still will not drink it. Each day since the spill has brought more troubling news. Now I wonder, is the chemical lodged in the water pipes of my home? Will I suffer long-term health effects from exposure to my water? These questions are frightening. What additional price will I pay for the gross negligence of others? We cannot undo the chemical spill, but we can make sure that such a tragedy never happens again. I ask that you consider Senate Bill 373 and strengthen it to its fullest so that it truly protects citizens and our natural resources. Include the recommendations of the Chemical Safety Board. And please make sure that all sources of potential contamination are regularly inspected and adequately regulated. It will be a long time before we fully understand the consequences of this tragic event. Our trust has been shaken, and it must be restored. I ask that you do all that you can to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nancy. You're listening to special coverage of the legislature today on West Virginia Public Radio. We are experiencing audio difficulties within the Capitol, so do not adjust your radio, and we apologize for the inconvenience. Thank you. Um, I'm Eleanor Spohr, and I live in Charleston, and the part of the area affected by the um, <coughs> water, by the spill. And along with so many here and so many others around the state, I believe that clean water should be a right. Um, we want a strong bill that provides protection uh, and so that to ensure that um, a catastrophe, catastrophe of this sort never happens again. And um, I, I urge that the uh, bill uh, 373 be strengthened so that it addresses, um, among other things, all the potential sources of contamination as uh, to the water supply as identified in the 2002 report and others. And that um, all facilities that pose such threats be adequately regulated and uh, inspected from the per permitting process on with no loopholes and no exclusions. And for me, that's just a matter of common sense. Please, no loopholes and no exclusions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And now I have Dr. Jessica McCauley from Cabin Creek Health Center, followed by Don Smith of Greenview Group Limited. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, all delegates and all of my fellow citizens. I'm Jessica McCauley. I am a maternal child health physician. Um, in this area, I live in Pinch and I practice in Bell, and I am eight months pregnant. Um, my disclosure is that I did not prepare a written speech, so bear with me. Um, my first concern, of course, was my unborn child. Um, the CDC has not yet lifted the ban for us who are carrying children. And because my main practice is children's health and pregnant women, it's a very large concern for me in my professional as well as my personal life. Small background. Um, for the Senate Bill 373, I have only read the overview and summary, so I haven't had the chance to really break it down. Um, what I did notice just on that brief overview and summary is there's no mention um, after the July 1st, 2015 deadline of the regulations being put in place, what would happen to those companies who were not compliant. So I would like that issue to be added and addressed. Um, and with inclusion to Senate Bill 373 and the other, there have not been any inclusions of the fixes of the current infrastructure. 
um, and the accountability not only of companies who own chemicals that have possibly leaked into the river, but also of companies, West Virginia American Water Company, who were responsible for helping to fix, clean up, um, bring back our water. Um, so I would like that point to be addressed as well. The red dot has spoken. Um, thank you very much. Um, have a good day. Thank you, ma'am. We now have Don Smith of Review Group Limited, followed by Connie, uh, Connie G. Lewis. Mr. Smith. Hello, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I'm going to be somewhat out of line because I'm not speaking to this bill particularly. My name is Don Smith. I have a little company called Greenview Group. I've um, started a little bamboo plantation at my place, and if we get the uh, hemp bill through, I plan on putting hemp and bamboo plantations up all over this state, and there are subsequent factories downstream from that. This kind of planning has taught me to think 5, 10, 15 years out. And like you, ever since this disaster happened, I've been spitting nails and fire. Everybody here, I'm sure, is quite upset and mad uh, that the entire situation has taken place. But it did occur to me while I was hauling bathwater to my bathtub, there is a solution to unscrew this thing. And it really involves a complete overhaul of the entire nine-county water system. It would require reopening some of these plants for the ability to take in water from a variety of different watersheds should one become poison. Tearing out old, hundred-year-old po uh, poison pipe now, and it would involve more or less taking the plumbing out of your house and replacing the appliances. It sounds like a very expensive plan, and it would be, but I'll remind you it wasn't that long ago that we were just the same as dropping that kind of money off of airplanes over Baghdad just a few years ago. That being said, that is the only way that we're going to unscrew this thing. There is no other way we will be able to convince people in this nation that they can come to West Virginia and enjoy cool, clear, clean, potable water. Give it some thought. If you guys like the idea, send it to them. They send it to the federal people. Let's ramrod this thing and make it happen. Start digging ditches. Thank you, Mr. Wilbur. We now have Connie. Connie, I can't get the middle name. I apologize. Lewis, followed by Thornton Cooper. Thing. I am Connie Graytop Lewis, a resident of Charleston, and my life has been negatively impacted by the incompetence of freedom industry, the ineptitude of the water company, and the inability of public officials who have the responsibility to protect the waters of West Virginia. Water which is, after all, owned by the public. Water which is in all religious traditions is considered sacred. It's not a commodity. It is sacred. I can still smell the licorice in our hot water. After flushing according to the instructions offered to the public, I expect we're in the market for a new hot water heater, and I do appreciate the suggestion of replacing all of the pipes. It may be necessary. My personal stake in this is that I have a fa my father and my grandfather both died of liver cancer. So anytime anything shows up in the water that doesn't belong there, I kind of freak out. I don't think you blame me. My husband's ancestors on both his maternal and paternal sides settled in this valley 240 years ago. He is the eighth generation to live in this valley close to the rivers. He's probably the last generation to do so. My family can afford the bottled water that we drink and cook with instead of the tap water that should be usable. We can afford the time to take our laundry 20 miles down the road to the laundromat with water we trust. But our neighbors aren't so lucky. 
So I am pleased that the legislature has begun to address the need to present similar incidents in the future. It's a, it's a beginning. It's only a beginning. Take the advice of the people who have dug more deeply into this legislation to improve it. And finally, I want to say West Virginians are often upset about their image or their perceived image in the rest of the world. We came to the world's attention. We were on Norwegian news. We were a lead story on the BBC. The LA Times, the New York Times, Washington Post, Atlanta Journal, Constitution. It is amazing. It is amazing the number of media outlets around the world, yes. European accents that were heard at the news conferences that the government had. If we wish to not be the laughing stock of the world, we need to fix this and do it right this time. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. We now have Mr. Thornton Cooper, followed by Scott Simonton. Thank you for having me here. My name is Thornton Cooper. I'm a native and resident of South Charleston and an attorney. And I've considered myself my entire life to be an environmentalist. It, it, I want to give you that perspective about how far we have come, even though we have a long way to go. This bill is an example of the fact that each generation must, must raise the bar in this state about what is expected in terms of protecting our groundwater and our surface water from ephemeral streams to the Kanawha River. When I was, in 1973, I was taking a graduate course in environmental studies, water pollution, at, in, at Institute. And having grown up in South Charleston, we were ribbed a lot about how much pollution we had because of our chemical plants, and we certainly were guilty. The people in Charleston used to laugh at us. But I was amazed when I was in that graduate course that at that time, 30% of Charleston's sewage went straight into the Canal River, whereas we cleaned up 100% in South Charleston. If you want to know what the, I was getting out a calculator, but it would be, I would say it was between a million and two million gallons a day of untreated sewage was coming from Charleston's sewers and going right by South Charleston. A million gallons, it would take, if you could imagine a cube, 50 by 50 by 50 feet, 125,000 cubic feet. You could fit that in here maybe. But it was more than that. That's how much sewage was coming, untreated sewage from Charleston. Now you talk about 10,000 gallons. That's about 11 by 11 by 11. So if I stretch from up from my toes to here and add three more feet, that's 11 feet. If you can imagine a cube of 11 by 11 by 11, that's what 10,000 gallons of this chemical is. The fact is, what was acceptable 20 years ago is not acceptable now, and we need to continue to strengthen our laws. I have reviewed, enrolled, been close to committee substitute for committee substitute for 373. It's a good bill. One thing I would change, fix chapter 24 would require that water companies have what we call planned redundancy, so that if there's a, something like this that happens in the intake, you have another intake that you can rely upon, rather than having the whole system shut down for a week or two. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. This is Scott Simonson, followed by Mr. Barry Rogers. I'm Scott Simonson from Sissonville. Uh, going forward, my big concern currently, and one of the things that we really should be addressing are the, the myriad of unknowns from this current spill. My concern is that uh, the DHHR doesn't have the basic knowledge of environmental science and engineering to accomplish the, the things that are set forward in West Virginia guidance on understanding the fate and transport of contaminants as they move through the environment, understanding that a lot of the contaminants that were spilled, and there was more than just one, uh, there were multiple chemicals, and understanding what happens to those chemicals in the environment. Uh, West Virginia DEP guidance mentions the term fate and transport more than 20 times in the guidance document. And so it, it's, it's important to understand that when we move forward, it's not just MCHM we're looking at. We're looking at MCHM and the six or so listed components with MCHM, including pure methanol or free methanol. We understand that free methanol easily converts 
to formaldehyde in the environment. So these aren't things that should be a surprise, and they should certainly not be things that we should deny can occur, but certainly they should be things that we should look deeper into, which is the point of this. And so moving forward, I hope that DHHR uh, uh, understands the basic tenets of, of environmental science and engineering and applies the guidance that the state already has in place as well as the federal government. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Barry Rogers, followed by Rebecca Roth and Ted Baker. Hi, my name is Barry Sean Rogers. I've only lived here for two and a half years, and I've lived in several states and Puerto Rico. I'm finding out I'm, I'm amazed at uh, how far behind in some areas West Virginia is compared to other places in the country. I, I inspections of these places. Restaurants get inspected every two to three months. I've worked in plenty of them. And, I mean, you get a violation for having sanitizer water not changed every hour. And yet these places are much more toxic, much more deadly than sanitizer water. Uh, the inspections, I mean, they should be having inspections on a minimum twice a year in these places. And uh, there's a, uh, I can't even read this. They haven't reported this bill. Uh, I think for nothing else, they should be criminally responsible for not reporting a spill like this immediately. They have, not only did they hold it one time for 20 hours, last Friday they reported something again that happened Thursday night, the night before. They're holding it from us again, and so many people's lives are in danger because of this. Uh, when I grew up in Los Angeles, the water board for decades has had people, scientists around the clock, testing the water quality to make sure it's safe. I thought that was common everywhere. I get here and I find out not only have they not been doing that, West Virginia American Water hasn't even been inspected for about five years, period. So I'd like to see a little bit more inspections. I know there's not just fault in this house, but all level of government. And some accountability for this, because I think they should be doing some hard time for having this happen and not reporting it to us. I know I've been having some health problems for quite, uh, several weeks, and since I quit drinking the water, it's just going away. So I'd like to thank you for hearing me, and uh, my vote in all elections while I'm in West Virginia is going to be whoever fights every, everything they've got to protect the citizens of West Virginia. Thank you, sir. We have Rebecca Roth and Ted Baker, uh, followed by Rachel Huff. I'm Rebecca Roth, uh, born and raised in West Virginia. For the past five years, I've lived in Charleston. My husband and I have a 20-month-old toddler named Lucy, and I'm pregnant with our second child. Our family has not used Charleston tap water since January 9th. We've done laundry at the St. Albans laundromat, and we've been using bottled water for drinking, cooking, dishwashing, and showering. We've been bathing our daughter by filling a Lowe's plastic bin with bottled water. About the bill. Hand in hand with closing the loopholes in our regulations, we need to guarantee enough inspectors and greater measurable enforcement. Let's do whatever it takes. Take money out of the rainy day fund. This is a rainy day if there ever was one. Request and use federal resources to do medical monitoring as soon as possible. Rebuild our water infrastructure. Consider a municipally owned water system. Test and commit to making each family's pipe safe. As citizens and as parents, let's hold our elected officials responsible for doing the jobs we voted for them to do and keep our water and our families safe. I know for sure I'm not the only mom who is thinking that if the water here can't be proven to be safe for my kids, at some point our family will have to leave. I've put down considerable roots here, but roots need water. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We now have Rachel Huff, followed by Margaret Chapman. Hello. Um, my name is Rachel Huff, and I just turned 26 years old, and I live with three roommates in Charleston, West Virginia. Um, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, but I've lived in West Virginia for most of my adult life after graduating from Marshall University about three years ago. And I'm not going to lie to you today. Um, when the chemical spill happened, my parents called me, and they asked, when are you going to leave? 
Um, and I wasn't the only one. Many of my friends' parents also asked, come home. Come home to Pennsylvania. Come home to Montana and Maryland. Uh, my friends and I don't want to leave. We love West Virginia. We play volleyball here at the YMCA. We uh, take trips on the weekends to Pocahontas County and Greenbrier County and many of the wonderful, wonderful places. Um, but I do wonder, what will I do when I want to have a family, when I'm ready to start roots here? And how will I know when I'm responsible for the health of someone else what it will be like in West Virginia? And so I hear legislators talk all the time, how do we attract young people to this state? Um, and their answer is usually to attract industries and businesses here with tax breaks or less regulations than that of our neighbors. And I don't think these legislators have malintent, but I do think their thought process is backwards. I think they're missing the point. You can't have jobs without health. It's not possible. In our backwards attempt to attract and keep industries in this state, what we're really doing is driving young people and young talent away. Health is the foundation of any functional society. The well-being of people in West Virginia should come before the well-being of coal, before natural gas, and before political campaigns. I don't think government is, is bad. Oppositely, I think government is good. And I want my government to govern. I want my government to regulate and provide oversight to industries that have proven over the past few decades that they are not capable of regulating themselves. Please strengthen Senate Bill 373 so that there are research-based regulations that will keep West Virginians safe. Please govern. Thank you. We now have Margaret Chapman, followed by Bruce Perot. She's a tough act to follow. Hi, I'm Margaret Chapman Pomponio, Executive Director of West Virginia Free. Um, some of you know I'm a women's health advocate. I'm also a wife and a stepmom. Um, I was raised in Jackson County, but I have spent most of my adult life in Kanawha County, affectionately known as the Chemical Valley. Um, I'm also an employer who is very interested in keeping talent like Rachel Huff and others who are part of the West Virginia Free staff who have moved here out of state um, to work. I'm very concerned about keeping a good workforce. Um, so as a stepmom, I haven't known what to tell our kids about the safety of the water. Um, as director of West Virginia Free, though, I do know exactly what to say. Um, it's clearly written in our mission. Um, part of our mission is to protect the right to bodily integrity and the right to parent in healthy, safe environments. So we're calling one uh, for the testing on chemicals like MCHM, um, thorough review and testing of these chemicals so that we understand the public health ramifications. What are the effects on pregnant women and all people? Number two, we call on the legislature and the governor to do all that you can to fully implement the Chemical Safety Review Board's recommendations. Please don't wait for another disaster to happen. We call on the legislature and the governor to do all that you can to inform the public about these disasters immediately. Sound the alarm bell. We've got it here in Kanawha County. Having grown up here, I know we have one. Put the beacon on. Um, I didn't hear an alarm. And, you know, confusion spreads. Not knowing creates more anxiety. And on that note, we'd like clarity on the CDC's advisory against pregnant women consuming water. How can you ensure that all pregnant women have this information? How do pregnant women get water? What is the timeline and criteria for lifting the CDC advisory? Thank you so much for helping us get answers. Thank you, Ms. Chapman. <clears throat> Mr. Bruce Perone, followed by Paul Sheridan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, legislature. My name is Bruce Peroni. I'm a resident of Kanawha County out near Frame. I'm going to start with a somewhat different take on this, <clears throat> which is to recognize the enormous damage this does to the future, the economic future of West Virginia. 
I mean, the PR industry, I understand, they say any publicity is good publicity, even bad. But I have a hard time believing that right now, and I suspect Commerce Secretary Burdett and the governor's economic development team doesn't think this is very good publicity. How are you going to entice the investment from industry in a state <clears throat> that's just gone through what's been called one of the worst toxic releases in American history, where nobody in the nine-county area is willing to drink the water today, where even the governor says at best, well, it's a personal decision whether to drink the water. Has anything ever so reinforced that negative image of our state is poor, benighted, ignorant, who would live there kind of state as this sort of event. And you can try to blame the chemical company, and that's where you have to start, for not having a groundwater protection plan, much less following it. But that's not the true cause of the disaster that left 300,000 people who will probably never, ever believe again that their water is not a cancer-causing agent. The real failure is the regulatory system that didn't make sure there was a groundwater protection plan, that almost willfully refused to carry out and enforce the rules that are in play. If you were a corporate chieftain elsewhere in this country, is this the state that you would want to invest in? Frankly, our state, I think, has been on a 50-year march to become the Wales of the United States, a former coal mining region mostly bereft of coal mining jobs and heading towards a future of an economically desolate land. We all know we've got to diversify our economy. We all know we've got to bring in new investment to the state. And yet here we are with a water disaster that exposes the worst possible face of the Brown, state. Please. There, so there's only one response that can be made. Decisive, dramatic action to show the world it will be different. We have got to repair this. We can't keep doing the same political Thank you, sir. Mr. Paul Sheridan, followed by John Cole Cooper. Thank you. My name is Paul Sheridan. I live with my family here in Charleston, and we are among the 300,000 uh, individuals who are currently living with, without safe, dependable water as a result of this spill. Um, I think there are a number of lessons um, that, that we can learn from this. One, if we're going to continue to make our homes in what I consider to be a wonderful place, um, and if we're going to develop our communities and develop our economy, then safe and healthy drinking water must be a priority second to none. Failure to protect the water and the economic development game is over. Secondly, a very compelling lesson from our recent experience, and one which I think we should never forget in democracy, is that public information and public participation is essential to an effective regulatory scheme. This crisis would have been much worse but for the involvement of citizens who stepped us up to protect us all. Freedom Industry made no effort to self-report the spill until DEP inspectors arrived at their door, and the inspectors did, did not move to discover the spill until members of the public prompted them. The public should have, and so we, there's a lesson here. We need the public participation to, to, to protect our safety, safety. The public should have access at every stage of the re regulatory process, and, and the law should include provisions which allow citizens to enforce the protections when government falls short. There also should be a, a role for local government. Uh, this, the local government involvement is one of the central recommendations of the United States Chemical Safety Board, which has investigated previous chemical disasters in this valley. Uh, and, and, and they found that the chemical, uh, the regulatory protections were wanting. And so that, that, the bill needs to be strengthened to include uh, uh, a role for local health officials and, and, and uh, first responders and others. And finally, while the, while the legislation, this legislation, which is a, a, an important and good step in the right direction, while it reduces the threat from above-ground storage tanks, we must recognize 
that we need a comprehensive protection for our water supply. And so there's a, uh, Thank you, additional steps that need to be made. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. John Cole Cooper, followed by Lisa Philpott. <clears throat> My name is Cole Cooper, and I'm a very proud West Virginian, and I'm serious about water quality. I was raised in Kanawha Chemical Valley on the river. Um, and I've been a river enthusiast as a whitewater paddler and outdoorsman for my entire 50, 50 years. And I know our watersheds and I know our culture. I have little confidence that this poison drinking water event will lead to significant improvements. Not just back to normal, because normal is not good enough. We need to shake the cultural expectations that West Virginians will accept it. And I want this issue to become a watershed moment in our history where we don't take it anymore. There are enough people talking about environmental regulations, and the regulations, while important, is only one element. And it will empower the people that have let us down. Regulation enforcers have shown the ability to of being inept at best or corruptible at worst. Also, it is not possible to protect 100% against intentional and unintentional contamination of our water source on the Elk River. Our future results are a combination of both regulation as well as leadership, and we are lacking in true leadership. I want retribution to the corporate and public officials that have failed us. Who is the individual responsible for making the decision to not shut down our water plant when an unknown substance was in our water supply? The rationale from West Virginia American Water press release said, if we had shut down the plant, people would have had no water at all. <laughs> Imagine a scenario for just a moment where that poor decision had resulted in thousands of gruesome deaths. We must have accountability of having the drinking water not only protected, but when we turn the faucet we know not only safe, but the highest quality water is possible. My vision is that within 48 hours, American, uh, West Virginia American Water establishes an upstream source around Coonskin, perhaps. Within one month, there is confidence by accountability, responsiveness, and quality reporting for water safety within both government and American Water. Mr. Cooper. Our, within six months, we are getting water from free-flowing water sources high in our watershed. Thank Summersville Lake. Within five years, we are known for the safest, most consistent, and best drinking water in the nation. What's your vision? Thank you, Mr. President. This is Lisa Philpott, followed by Jesse Johnson. Hi, I'm Lisa Philpott. I'm owner of Kanoa IT Services, and I live in St. Albans. I'm here not because I am affected, but I am in fact, I'm affected indirectly with my friends, my family, my co-workers, my customers. Everyone was welcome to come to our house and take showers, do laundry, give their children's baths, take baths themselves. We had jugs upon jugs upon jugs that we sent out our front door for these people. My mother and father are retired. I don't know how this is going to affect them. My daughter is a full-time waitress plus a full-time student here in Charleston. She lives in South Charleston. She lost wages and she's trying to make it in this world. What's going to happen to her? She's 26 years old. Uh, I just want more regulation and again, I know you are probably tired of hearing this word, but accountability and we need to take care of our water so this stops now and nobody else is harmed. Plus, we can keep jobs in our state, which is what Canal IT Services is all about, being your neighbor. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. 
Mr. Jesse Johnson, followed by Tom Rule. I'm Jesse Johnson, three-time nominee of, for governor with the Mountain Party. If you may have heard that, you may have not have. One thing I'd like for you to hear is my sustained outrage over a decade of talking about these very issues. First thing I'd like to take a moment for, for a brief prayer. Dear God, how about a, re, a, a redo, a do-over? Because this is, a, this is your opportunity for that as a body. And I, and I thank the citizens of West Virginia whose house this belongs to for giving us this opportunity. But we all need a redo. We need a, a do-over of, of, of a huge magnitude. <clears throat> West Virginia, the birthplace of rivers, was, was knocked down to the point where its water was only good for two things, putting out fires and flushing the toilet. And that's questionable. This should not happen. There's a number of things that should take place. I have, as I've heard many other people here talk about, uh, little faith that things will change. Um, this, the people that gives me that faith. And when I mention that, re, that redo, Maya and I asked the question here, who's dedicated to make the water safe for us going forward? And I saw every citizen's hand go up. And I, every legislator in my view, seem to forget to raise their hand along with the citizenry of this state. The protection of our water resources is the most important thing we have. It's life itself. When we go searching other planets for life out in space, that's exactly what we're looking for is water. We need protection of water resources and the public health and safety. We need baseline testing for all water resources in the state of West Virginia, henceforth, going forward, so we know with the industries who are exempted from telling you what they're using in their proprietary tools, that we can test for those in our intakes and know going forward that we have a chance of survival. This could have been far worse. It's an embarrassment how systemic the problems are in this state. 300,000 plus people now communing with those people of Printer and Rawls and Merrimack and Sprigg and the Southern Coal Fields, the people on Long Route 50 who have, who have had, been poisoned for quite some time. Now we are comparatively equal to them, 300,000 to our functionally illiterate in the state of West Virginia. Let's do something about this, people. Mr. Tom Rule, followed by Chris Hamilton. My name's Tom Rule. I'm a longtime resident of Kanawha County. I'm also the uh, uh, information and uh, communications director for the Mountain Party. Uh, I'd like for folks to understand that um, we, Jesse and I, have both been in contact with people all over the state, both before this incident and during this entire incident and my experience along with Jesse's has been that there are people in the northern part of the state that says this tears it we're leaving if the people in, in Kanawha County in this city in Charleston can't control their own water there's no way that they're going to protect us up in the over uh counties of Doddridge, Wetzel, Tyler, Harrison and the other counties and I'll tell you something else the governor bragged that we do we are doing testing of uh, MCHM at uh, parts per billion. We have the capability to do it do it ten times better than the CDC recommendation, safe recommendation. Well, that's a stretch to start with, but there's something that was entirely forgotten when they passed that drill baby drill Marcellus bill after everybody raised Cain about it in this house and, you know they shoved that bill through there, there's another chemical that, that is the reason that the New York state legislature has passed a fifth moratorium and stopped drilling up in New York State people people need to look at what is going on up there Marcellus isn't less dangerous in West Virginia 
And the people in New York State are uh, more, more uh, valuable. Maybe they're smarter, but they're not more, any more valuable than the lives here. What I'm getting at is that the, the New York State Department of Environmental Quality tested 24 Marcellus samples, flowback samples. In 24 of 24, there was a chemical that came up called 4-NQO. It's 4-nitroquinoline-1-methylene -methyl or something like that. It's, it's 4-NQO. Thank you. I'll, I'll wrap it up. This 4-NQO is odorless, tasteless, colorless, and it's cancer-causing, known to be cancer-causing, in parts per trillion. Now that's why that's one of the reasons that radiation is what the two major reasons that they're not uh, given permits to dump Marcellus waste in New Jersey and New York right now. Thank you, but Mr. here we we're just going to let let that dump and not test for it. Thank you, sir. We now have Chris Hamilton of the West Virginia Business and Industry Council, followed by. Michaela Morrison, I believe. Molly? Okay. Mr. Hamlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the West Virginia House of Delegates, for the opportunity to address your committee to speak to Senate Bill 373. Like many of the speakers before me, I'm also a lifelong resident of this great state, born and raised here. I live here, work here, and play here. And over the past, past four decades, I and my family have swam, we fished, and we hunt along the Elk River Basin. I'm here today on behalf of the West Virginia Business and Industry Council. It is comprised of more than 60 West Virginia trade associations and businesses and collectively account for more than 395,000 state employees across some 26 separate industry categories. And like me and most here within the House, they also work and they play here. And they also take full advantage of our wonderful natural resources that people come from all over the country to participate and to enjoy. In response to the Freedom Industries chemical spill that affected the lives of some 300,000 West Virginians, engrossed Senate Bill 373 will regulate independent industrial above-ground storage tanks to, pr to protect against a similar situation from occurring in the future. These are storage facilities that heretofore went unregulated or uninspected. The legislation establishes state agency and multiple independent inspections by certified engineers, along with redundant groundwater protection and containment plans to provide the necessary safeguards to again ensure similar accidents don't happen again. Additionally, Senate Bill 373 places additional requirements on all existing state industries that rely on public water supplies so that they are protected both from a quality and, and quantity standpoint. The West Virginia Business and Industry Council compliments Governor Tomlin, our legislative leaders, for their quick and judicious work behind Senate Bill 373. Mr. Hamilton. This landmark legislation deals directly with certain unregulated industrial sites to protect water supplies and to enhance overall environmental protection. What occurred at Freedom must never again happen here in West Virginia, and BIC members stand ready to offer our resources and expertise from within our membership as we craft this needed amendment to public policy here in West Virginia. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Hamilton. Chairman. Michael A. Morrison, I think that's correct. Yes, followed by Rochelle uh, Beckner. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Morrison, and I live in Barsville in Cabell County. 
And I just want to say that uh, on the Senate Bill 373, just, it just don't go far enough. And I don't trust him. I don't trust the man that just got through speaking here. I never, every time he opens his mouth, it's a lie. But I'll go past that. I just want to, I'd like to start off with talking about there are over 100 coal prep plants in West Virginia that store the chemical MCHM, and at each site, they store a thousand gallons each at each site like the one at Freedom Industries. At Freedom Industries, there were no secondary containment at the tank in case of a spill. The other 100 coal prep plant doesn't have a secondary containment at each tank. And the same thing could happen at any one 100 coal prep plant's storage tanks. Man, we, we need regulation and we need enforcement. You know, I've been up here lobbying. When the coal associates, coal associates to come walks in here, oh, they're scared to death. They got to pay attention to them, not the people. But just later, they knew about the water. We've been up here for years telling them the water. You know, they just wouldn't listen to us because they're bought off the big coal. But anyway, regulation without enfor enforcement is meaningless, and. Uh, I, I just want to say about this Senate Bill 373, you know, please close the loopholes. No more loopholes for industry. I repeat, no more loopholes for industry. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Michelle Beckner from Cape, followed by Michael Pushkin. Good evening. My name is Rochelle Beckner, and this is my daughter, Belle, and she's eight, and this is my daughter, Lily, and she is seven. And we missed a church league basketball game tonight for her because I thought it was more important for them to see this process and for you all to see them. Because they are a representation of thousands of children in this city and in infected areas um, in, the, in our region. This industrial accident affected our school system and invaded our homes. I'm not a scientist, an activist maybe, if you consider being here tonight and speaking as an activism, but like a mother bear, I'm here to protect my children. Every night at bedtime, we ask our girls, what do we always do? We do the right thing. We are asking you to do the right thing. You've heard a lot of things tonight. You've heard a lot of great suggestions from a lot of people, and those are the right things. The right things for the people of our state, not the industry. I am not anti-business nor anti-economic development. In fact, I'm currently an EMBA student at WVU. Business is important in our state, but responsible business. Ones who operate legally, ethically, morally, and doing so socially and environmentally responsibly. This is the single most important issue that you as a legislature can address this session. Invest money in inspecting these facilities. Do not reduce any existing water regulations. You need to strengthen them. You need to develop a crisis plan and implement the recommendations from the Chemical Safety Board. Show me and my girls that you know how to do the right thing and protect the people who elected you to this office. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mike Pushkin, followed by Mr. Sam Hickman. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for allowing this public hearing. My name is Mike Pushkin. I live, I was born here in Charleston. I was raised here in Charleston. I live in Charleston. I work in Charleston. I own a home on the west side of Charleston. And uh, like the last speaker and like the governor of this state, I'm not a scientist. Uh, and I'm, I think it's safe to assume that many of the members of this body, the elected officials in this body, are, are not scientists either. However, the Chemical Safety Board is made up of scientists. The Chemical Safety Board has been to this valley three times since 2008. They have made many recommenda they've made recommendations in the past, and uh, those recommendations have never made it to committee. Those recommendations from the Chemical Safety Board have never made it to committee. <clears throat> The chemical spill into our water supply was preventable. The recommendations of the Chemical Safety Board need to be incorporated into this bill. 
I'd like to thank Delegate Skinner in, in advance for the, the bill that's going to have the chemical safety boards in it, I believe. Is that correct? Thank you. Um, I don't know. I'll, Real quick, just all too often, you know, we West Virginians are patted on the back for being strong when there's a crisis, for coming together when there's a crisis. And I'm tired of having to come together in times of crisis. Uh, I'm, I'm tired of having to be strong every time there's a crisis. I, I, you know, being strong is commendable, but, you know, let's be smart and prevent the crisis before it happens. You know, let's implement the recommendations of the Chemical Safety Board this time. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sam Hickman, followed by Jennifer Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Sam Hickman. I'm the director of the West Virginia chapter of the National Association of Social Workers. I'm here as a private citizen tonight. I live on the unfashionable side of South Hills. I grew up in Dunbar. That makes me a Dunbarbarian, I'm told. And um, my ancestry in West Virginia includes both the founder of Mother's Day and the leader of the Miners' Rebellion. My father worked at DuPont at the Bell Works for 40 years and then later died of cancer. I want to talk to you about at-risk populations tonight. At-risk can have many meetings, many, many meetings, physical, emotional, social, environmental. Physically, uh, I am unfortunately the member of an at-risk population. I have adult onset allergies. I unknowingly took a drink of the water on that Thursday evening and the next day, for the first time in my life, I had blood in my urine. I went to seek medical attention. I had an ultrasound of my kidneys and bladder, and they came back negative, thank goodness. My eyes, my skin are inflamed by the, the chemical in the water. I have a $100 antibiotic in my pocket to take care of that. My skin gets red and itchy in contact. Now, I can handle it. I'm a big boy, but there's a lot of folks who cannot handle it. They don't have the resources that I have. They don't have the ability to have transportation. They don't have adequate money. They don't have physical ability or friends and families to help them out. At-risk people without resources need special attention and help. On Sunday, January 12th, my partner in life and I delivered some water to some folks who had called Canal County Emergency Services. An elderly woman with mobility limitations whose children live out of town, a low-income woman who had very few resources, a disabled man who was confined to a wheelchair, a young man living on the top of a mountain whose neighbors had all vacated because of the water crisis and whose vehicle had broken down. My point, Mr. Chairman, is this. We may all be equal under the law, but we are not equal in our abilities and our limitations and our resources. Special populations need special accommodations. This bill, Senate Bill 373, should include long-term medical monitoring, relief for lost wages, and water, potable water, provided to people until their confidence is restored. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hickman. We now have Jennifer Burns, followed by Robert Reiser. Or Reiser. Hi, my name is Jennifer Burns, and I am a mother of four children, ranging in the age of 21 to 12. I am the grandmother of three children, ranging in the age of three and twins that are a little over a year old. And I am also a small business owner that was directly affected by the chemical spill. Actually, my entire family was affected by this chemical spill along with my business. I'm a caterer, and my business is located in Charleston's urban west side. And um, I was closed down by no fault of my own for several days, and I continue to suffer the consequences of big industry's inability to comply with um, the... Uh, the rules and regulations that they're supposed to comply with and their right to do big business and be negligent infringed on my right to be in business and to feed my family. I'm a small business, so the money that I make with my business is my milk money. It feeds my children. It pays my rent. It pays the rent on my business, and I go month to month sometimes just to pay the bills. I am not like the coal industry, and let's be very, very clear. 
This is not about big versus small, Republican versus Democrat. It is about doing the right thing. And West Virginia has an opportunity right now. We can do the right thing. Right, Mr. Hamilton? With the Coal Association, let's do the right thing. Let's do the right thing as legislators and actually be the Cinderella story that we can become, to be ahead of this, to be prideful and say, while we believe that industries should be here and we welcome them, they do not need to do that and infringe and infringe on our rights for the health and the safety of all the people of West Virginia. I am extremely disappointed to look around and see all the empty chairs here. Where is everybody? chairs are not filled with the delegates that are supposed to be there. Is this so insignificant tonight that we can leave and walk away? It's silent, isn't it? It's sad that this is so insignificant to some of, the, of our elected delegates. And I'm not going away. And the people that have joined us in organizations and organizing, they're not going away either. And there's an election coming up. This isn't over. And what happens during this session is important. And people That's are fine. watching you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Robert Reiser. Uh, who, is a, who is a social worker followed by Scott McMillan, sculptor. Thank you, Jenny Burns. You're a tough act to follow. Um, I'm born and raised in West Virginia. I love this state. Never thought I'd leave this state. Now it's a consideration. For me, the number one issue is about trust. I do not believe that this state is taking appropriate measures to keep our water safe. You're telling me that our water is safe. I need more proof. How can you prove to me, my daughters, my granddaughters, that the water you want them to drink is safe? Also, I don't think that anybody should have to pay to have their water tested because of somebody else's negligence. And I too am especially concerned that there are so many vulnerable West Virginians who cannot afford to have their waters tested and are using unsafe water. One thing I think we're looking at Bill 373, there are too many loopholes. All tanks and all additional sources of contamination need to be adequately regulated. We deserve thorough protection from all contamination threats to our water supplies. And lastly, I think there needs to be a method to track the people who are seeking medical treatment for water-related issues and a follow-up with them over the course of the next several years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Scott McMillan, sculptor, followed by Jody McMillan. Your right to keep hazardous substances ends at my property line. Okay, I live on the west side, I live right by the river. I was impacted. I could smell it for weeks. Smelled it in my toilet for a long time, still can smell it now. Okay, I flushed my pipes three times. Just, the first time I did it, just like the water company said, didn't do anything, didn't work. I took scientists' recommendations from out of state, it worked much better, okay? This summer, somebody broke into my home and the criminals stole 15 bucks and change. Okay. On January 9th, somebody pumped toxins into my house and it cost me thousands of dollars in lost work, lost work of my wife, and I'm going to have to redo my plumbing. I don't trust it. I don't trust it at all. Okay. These are law and order issues. Okay. If you can't protect my property and my health, that's important. Okay. That's a breakdown of law and order. Okay, this is important. Because of the continuous lack of protection of my home, we only use the tap water for flushing still to this day. It still smells. We use other sources for all other uses. Okay, that's it. We just flush the toilet with it. That's, that's all it's good for. I won't water my plants with it. 
It killed my plants. I have plants that I protected all winter. They died. We won't cook with it until the, DE, the DEP inspection practices are completely changed and take the Chemical Safety Board recommendations. All of them. All the recommendations of the Chemical Safety Board. The PSC regulatory practices need to change completely. Okay, It's not working. The PSC is not working. They're not listening to the people here. They need to also test the water and they need to move the inlets when appropriate. Health department tests need to go into every restaurant and building. When they, when they check out a restaurant, test the water. It's really simple. If there's something in the water, track it back. Give them the ability to find polluters. Give the locals the ability to do this. We need elected officials responsible for these things. That way, when they mess up, we can vote them out. It's important. This is important. I'm still, for the first two weeks, I flushed my toilet with rainwater. I live on the west side. I collected it and I flushed the toilet with rainwater. That's not something that happens in America. That's something that happens in some third world country. I'm serious about this. I will go and I will knock on other people's doors forever to fix this. This is important. Mr. Allen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jody McMillan. Massage therapist, Jody. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Jody McMillan, and I'm just a, a citizen, concerned citizen like you. And um, I moved back to West Virginia from California, so um, I made an effort to come back here because I miss the mountains and the fresh streams and rivers and lakes. And many people already said what I was going to say, so I kind of just wrote up a little thing while I was um, sitting over there. Um, I'm a self-employed massage therapist, and my husband just spoke. He's a sculptor, so we wouldn't be considered rich by any means. Um, the average citizen cannot financially afford to fix this problem. We cannot afford the cleanup, the in-home water tests, the bottled water, the medical bills, the gas to travel to shower and to do laundry. Please don't pass this cost onto your citizens. You must step in as our government and make industry internalize the cost because they're the ones that have the money. Um, our communities need also the continuation of water distribution sites to all affected communities. We need continued studies. Please do not scare away the scientists. Um, th th we need to monitor the chemicals in our water. All the chemicals are probably more than we even know. Um, please involve um, these studies and in the water tests in this bill. Um, also, the quality of life of your family, children, grandchildren, friends and neighbors is worth all of this effort. And believe me, I know this is a lot of effort. West Virginians are strong, adaptable people, but do not take advantage of these qualities. Economic growth will slow to a halt if the brand of West Virginia cannot be changed from a toxic zone to wild and wonderful again. The only way to keep it wild and wonderful is to enforce protection. Please be brave and think about true priorities. We cannot drink money, only water, only pure, clean water. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. <laughs> Mr. Jeff Allen from the West Virginia Council of Churches, followed by Mel Hoover of the West Virginia Interfaith Council. Mr. Allen. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Jeff Allen. I am the Executive Director of the West Virginia Council of Churches and the United Methodist Pastor. The West Virginia Council of Churches in its 2014 public policy booklet encourages both the legislature and the Department of Environmental Protection to strengthen rules that safeguard water quality and quantity. The reason is clear, and we've heard many reasons tonight. If only 1%, just 1%, of the persons affected by the Freedom Chemical Spill have long-term health issues, that's 3,000 people. That's roughly the same amount of people who died in the World Trade Center on 9-11. But the reality is that even one person is far too many to be impacted by poor water quality in our state, and many vulnerable populations have been impacted by this chemical spill, including our elderly, pregnant women, the poor and children. 
Clean water is not a luxury, it is a right. As Christians, we affirm that each and every individual has intrinsic value. Therefore, we encourage the legislature to close all loopholes in this legislation, require individual permits and inspections, and allow full community involvement in water protection plans. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Mel Hoover, followed by Mr. Chuck Ristock. Mr. Mel Hoover. Mr. Chuck Ristock, or Rystock. Rystock. I'd like to thank uh, Delegate Purdue for taking the initiative and putting this together. Thank you, and I know I butchered your name. <laughs> it's been butchered before. Um, I'm here as a private citizen tonight. Um, I, uh, I'm in West Virginia by choice. I've been here over 35 years, and I'm not going anywhere. I love this state. I think we have an opportunity here because there is a silver lining behind this cloud of the spill. And right now, it seems to me like the eyes of America are upon us because we're at a crossroads. One of those paths is the status quo. And all Americans will shake their heads in disbelief if we continue to go down that road of being a polluted extraction colony. The other path is forward-looking and one that demonstrates that we can shine as innovators, that we can supersede everybody's expectations by making the strongest pollution laws with enforcement that has teeth. We need to do this so that people who might want to move here can say, hey, they really got it. They have tighter rules and enforcement than anywhere. If we fail to do that, who would want to move their family here? What company would set up shop here? Eventually, our economy would be as stagnant as the water coming out of the American Water Company. The companies who willingly pollute, the politicians who are in bed with these companies, the regulators who look the other way, had better get out of the way, for as they probably already know, they are in the minority. The people in the majority are us and they've awakened a sleeping giant. The leaders of the state better take this to heart or they can take the old worn out path to the dead end sign at the end of that road. If they fail to act creatively and courageously to make sure that when you go to vote in November, you take a bottle of water into the voting booth with you to remind you what happened. We've had, a, we've had our waters polluted and poisoned here for over a hundred years, and everybody knows that. These waters of this state, by law, are owned by the citizens, not by the industry. The governor, the legislature, and the DEP are on notice. Enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the speakers, but I, first of all, I have to say from up here, uh, God bless you. You hung around, you said what you had to say, you didn't have enough time to say it. None of us have enough time to say everything that needs to be said tonight. I hope that over the next few weeks, the chairman and I, our staff, chairman and finance committee, will be able to get through what you've given us tonight. I hope that we're going to be able to do at least a part of what you ask. I pray that we listen from now on, because it sounds like with what happened, I think you'd agree, we weren't listening. Ladies and gentlemen, I would la like to ask the members of our committee, if anyone of our committees, if anyone has a question for any individual uh, speaker tonight. Anyone? I have no request for saying then I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.